feel free to turn to the book of Psalms, Old Testament work, kind of right in the middle of the Bible. Psalm 23, we're going to open 2022 with really this beloved portion of Scripture. I mean, I'm willing to bet that once I begin reading this, many of you can probably in your mind begin to quote the words. We're likely that familiar with it. If not, let me just say, there is a very good reason why these six verses are just so beloved and so timeless and so universal, where people who don't know the Lord or know Scripture are likely quite familiar with this psalm or at least some of the opening lines. I'm going to read it in its full, and then I'll give you a little bit of information. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I like the older translations. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes or restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, once again the older translations, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord, church, for how long? Forever. Psalm 23, penned by David, who was both a king and himself a shepherd in his youth. It celebrates what we'll call the providential care of God, using the imagery of an earthly shepherd attending to his flock. And it's staggering how much just six verses touches upon in life and living, as we're going to note over the course of this week and likely the next. And born of this text, I want to offer what I'm going to call a series of resolutions for 2022, resolutions that are meant to inform and impact our trajectory in the new year, individually and corporately. For those who are wondering, a resolution, how many know that this is the time for New Year's resolutions? A resolution is simply a statement of purpose, that which you intend to accomplish in life and living. And I want to look at Psalm 23, or this 23rd Psalm, through this particular lens or filter. Now, I have an absolute ton of information in my notes. Did everybody hear that? There's a lot of information here. If I were you, come Tuesday or Wednesday, download them off the internet, um, newlifebarry.org. There's so much, it's likely going to take two weeks. I I highly doubt that if I take my time with this, I'll be able to finish this in the next 20 to 23 minutes or so. But I want to go a piece at a time, a fragment at a time, and I want to, to consider the question, based on Psalm 23, what changes, what additions, what subtractions should I make in my life over the course of the new year? Based upon the precepts, the truths of this text, what are some things I should see in 2022. We're going to begin with just the opening words. Verse 1, part A. The Lord is my shepherd. What do I resolve upon hearing this classic passage? What resolutions do I derive from those four or five words for my own life and prayerfully for yours? This morning, you are going to benefit from the overflow of my time with the Lord. These are things that I see in the text. It's entirely possible that the psalm might hit you differently in some areas. And there are other resolutions that you might adopt based upon what the Spirit of God is whispering to your heart. I would say make sure you're taking the time to listen to that still small voice and see what sticks for you based out of this message or the Lord's word for you. I'll say number one. And I have 25 different resolutions total for the entire psalm. I am not looking for each of you to apply all 25 points. There might be three or four that really stand out to you. But I want to see, based on the psalm, some things that we should consider. Number one, I will say, I will both recognize and submit to the Lord as my shepherd. I will recognize and I will submit to the Lord as my shepherd. 
If there is one thing I am done with in my own life, and if there's one thing I'm really done with in the church world, it's people acting as if they are qualified to be their own shepherds. David, as king of a nation, did not in his own life seek to take the reins, but he recognized that he required someone to do the work of the shepherd in his own life. And that someone for him was the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. When you hear those words, when you say those words, to what degree is that truth, that simple truth, genuinely in operation in your life? To what degree are you the type of person who is continually taking the proverbial reins out of the hands of the Lord in trying to do things according to your own strength, your own wisdom, your own capacity, your own prowess or expertise. I'm looking at a group of people. There may not be a ton of us, but there are, in each of us, there are unique skill sets and areas of expertise and you have intelligence and wisdom and all of those things are good. But to what degree are you inclined to rely on those things versus trusting in the Lord as the one and looking to the Lord as the one who is called to be your shepherd? Christianity, if anything, is founded upon this idea that we are to properly respond to the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's not just looking to be your friend. Now, we derive the benefit of being friends with God, but that is all founded upon this idea that he is Lord. Who runs the flock, the sheep or the shepherd? We need to live according to that truth. It says in the book of Romans 10, you can just jot down that reference. This is how Christianity starts, by the way. This is the starting point. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Other words that you could use, master. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, according to Paul, you will be saved. Your Christianity did not begin the moment you believed that God existed. The devils believe that and tremble, Scripture says. But you received the benefit of what Jesus did the moment that you trusted in him uniquely as Lord. Meaning from that point on, your life's purpose was to accomplish his and his alone. Now, we don't do that perfectly. We fall short of that daily sometimes hourly at times, but it is the Christian's mission and duty and highest life's joy to continually reorient to the one who is our Lord and the good shepherd. So I think that's a resolution that is foundational for life and living. And if you're going to be the kind of believer and or a Christian who's going to just want to do things your own way, don't be surprised if 2022 knocks you around quite a bit. Because I think this nation's in the midst of a time where there's going to become more of a division between those who are submitted to his lordship and those who are not. In the church and outside of the church. Number two, kind of the flip side to that opening point is I will celebrate his willingness to be my shepherd. Honestly, don't you think the God of the universe has other things he could be spending his time doing? Genuinely think about that. The God of all things has stooped, I'll use that word deliberately, to come down into your little life and function as your shepherd. Now, that's not to diminish or devalue us because we are made in the image of God. But the psalmist said, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? In other words, God, why do you even bother paying attention to us? What are human beings that you care for them? Why would God want to function as a shepherd? I don't have a full answer to that question, but I will tell you, I celebrate the fact that he does. Because even if he doesn't need to be in this relationship, because the shepherd in that sense, God of the universe, doesn't need us. He does it joyfully and willingly and voluntarily. But I desperately need him. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment or two, that we as sheep are in desperate need of a shepherd, and particularly a good shepherd. So I will submit to his lordship and shepherding, but I'm also going to rejoice in it, that God is willing to, to be a part of such an intimate connection that benefits me, I'll say in many degrees, far more than benefits him. Number three, I will reject every other potential shepherd be it of the flesh, the world, or the devil. I'm going to give you a few bullet points under this one. I will reject every and any other shepherd, be it of the world, the flesh, or the devil. 
How many of you, like me, you would say that you're a fallen creature and left to your own devices, you're going to make a mess of things? I say it all the time, I mean it sincerely. When the Lord calls himself a shepherd, that immediately means that we are in the position of a sheep. And when God likens us to sheep, he is not doing us any compliment. I've never been a shepherd, but I've studied a lot on this. And I know human nature well enough that left to our own devices, our own inclinations, we are so prone to stray. So despite what intelligence I may have, as limited as it is, or wisdom, or perspective, or capacity, as I mentioned earlier, I am by no means qualified to call the shots in my own life. I will wreck it. And if I can't be my own shepherd, this is free for you this morning. I am by no means qualified to be your only shepherd. Now, in Christ, I might serve as an under-shepherd, but how many shepherds, good shepherds, do you truly have? One, and his name is Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind. I'm not qualified to run my own life. I am to submit my life to him, to look for it, to him for direction, and then do what he says to do, as Bubba said earlier, that we as sheep would have hearts that are soft and tender, that when the shepherd leads or tells us to do, we follow and do. What if Christianity was really that simple? You ready for the grand answer to that? It is. The problem is that it's so counter to our nature. I'll say kind of on a second note to this point, the world and its systems, because they are established by fallen humans, they themselves are prone to be fallen, carnal, and corrupt. And the worldly systems that are in place are also not qualified to function as my shepherd. Can I just step on some toes, especially among younger people? I do not understand the movement in our culture that wants to empower the government to make every decision for every part of your life. And for those who want to go down that road, which by the way, taken to its own extreme, tends to lead to mass graves. Study history, gang. How many of you have ever, ever spent time at the RMV? Or the DMV. Honestly, who's ever spent time? You had to renew a license in person. Do you really want that crew running everything? Now hear me, those who are here and at home. I have nothing but respect for the people who serve this nation. But in many ways, the government has no need to be efficient or effective because they have no competition. And because they're people just like me, Despite their best intentions, they are also not qualified to be my primary and only shepherd. Now, do rulers and institutions have their place? Yes. And biblically, we are called to submit to them within the bounds of Scripture. But I don't look to the government as my shepherd. I don't look to a, a human ruler as the one that is the sole voice in my life that I'm to orient to. You wonder what they call that? They call that a cult or a dictatorship. And number three, the devil is more than happy to take the reins of my life. Satan is continually sending you applications looking for the position of shepherd. And you want to know the reality, many of us let him in the door and let him rule the roost. We might profess Christ as Lord, but the reality is, is that many times, even in the church world, the decisions that we make, the values that we hold, the choices that we entertain and ultimately embrace, they're not guided by biblical principles. And even if you profess Christ, if you don't obey him, there's a corresponding price. Building your house on sand, even when you say you're building on a rock, does not yield a rock-like result. So when the wind and the rains come, and they will, don't be surprised if parts of the house begin to collapse. They weren't founded properly in the first place. There's a lot there, gang. I'm giving you some good stuff that if we can all, myself included, put these very simple, fundamental principles into operation, we're going to be better. I'll just add kind of a fourth one, but it's really a rehash. I will recognize my inclinations and limitations as a sheep. And therefore, I will stay close to the Lord. You know, gang, the reality is over 2022, your life is your own. I ultimately have very little influence directly over it. My job is to cast lots of seed into point. What you do with it is on who? You. But as for me, 
after about 20 years as a believer, I've just come to the realization that as a human left to my own devices, I'm prone to stray. The book of Isaiah says it this way, we all like sheep have gone, what? Astray. And each of us has turned to our own way. That is my wiring that I have to continually transcend as I submit to him. That was a lot for the first five words of a six-verse psalm. Help the pastor out, fill in the blank. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want more modern translations. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. What do I resolve based upon the hearing of this word? Well, a few things. A few I will statements that I want to give you. I will recognize the goodness of God in the fullness of his provision for me. I'm going to repeat that. I will recognize, because again, as a sheep that's prone to stray, many times my mind and my heart don't think this, don't believe this. But I will recognize his fundamental goodness in the fullness of his provision for me. I want to give you a verse out of 2 Peter. Don't turn there, but 2 Peter chapter 1 essentially opens with these words. Verse 3 of the opening chapter. His divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. How much has God the Father through Christ provided for you? Everything you will need. Not everything that you will want. I think that's where oftentimes Christians begin to struggle in their relationship with the Lord is that we have these deep felt wants. God is not obligated or obliged to meet your every want or every desire that pops into your head. But in the areas where you have genuine need, as he defines it, he has obligated himself through Christ to meet your every need. I ask you the rhetorical question this morning, what do you genuinely need that he does not perfectly provide? I challenge you with that. Now, we, we might say we lack nothing, but many of us live lives where we continually feel like maybe the Lord's a bit of a deadbeat dad. And if he would only do X, Y, or Z... You stay close to the shepherd and you're going to realize, as I've been saying a lot lately, and I'm repetitive on purpose, God, it turns out, is actually really good at his job. I want to add a side note that provision in my life does not come from my own power or capacity, but from his working. Now, that is not knocking the place of work and so forth. But at no point should we ever think that we are our own providers, that everything that we have and do, it comes just from us. Because if you get up in the morning and you go to work, guess what? You've probably experienced 20 miracles. You can move, you can breathe, you have God-given wisdom and instinct and capacity that makes all of that possible. And if we would but think in that direction, maybe it would catalyze a little bit more praise, worship, and thanksgiving, which is the second point for this in terms of resolution. I will celebrate any and every provision of the Lord with both thanksgiving and renewed dedication. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but it's in my notes. When you read Psalm 103, that, that psalm, for me, is one of my favorites. It's this incredible listing of all of the things that God has done and does and purposes to do. And there's a sense of thanksgiving and worship and praise in response. I'll just read the opening few verses. The author speaking to himself. Praise the Lord, my soul. Sometimes we got to stir ourselves up a little bit. And realize the benefit of what we have in the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. And that psalm is a listing of the benefits of being associated with him. What does he do? He forgives all of our sins. He heals all of our diseases. He redeems our lives from the pit. He crowns us with love and compassion. He satisfies our desires with good things. And he renews us so that we are renewed like the eagles. Is. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. I will celebrate over the course of 2022 when God does something on my behalf or meets a need. Now the reality is, 
You ready for this? We would never stop worshiping, praising, or offering corresponding thanks because God is continually at work. But you want to know the problem? Oftentimes we're continually oblivious and don't see it. Which leads me to point number three for this. In moments of perceived lack, that word perceived in my notes is it's highlighted. In moments of perceived lack, I will look to the Lord, availing myself of this thing called prayer. So in my life, if there's an area where I feel like there is a need, guess what I can do in light of that? Hey, Lord, I come before you, not in my own name, but in the name of Christ Jesus, and I want to just lift some things to you. God has set this thing up where he has established prayer, not because he doesn't know your needs, but because he wants you. And there is something about that transaction of spending time with the Lord that he does great and mighty things in us and then ultimately through and for us. And kind of secondarily, I will resist. And this is a huge one that for many of us is going to be the resolution we should adopt. I will resist adopting a spirit of complaint, grumbling, or murmur. Gang, it is tragic. I'm stop talking to myself. You're just getting the benefit of it. It is tragic how much we complain. Now, maybe you're way ahead of me in the race, and you've reached a point that whatever comes out of your lips is always just Thanksgiving and rainbows and sunshine. But the reality is I know many of you, and I know myself very well, and it's very easy to fall into that place of complaint where you see all the things that the Lord allegedly hasn't done for you versus spending time focusing on the things that he has and then pivoting to a place based upon thanksgiving and worship where you petition him further. You know, I don't want to spend 2022 following in the footsteps of the ancient Hebrews who came out of the, out of the, out of the uh, land of bondage, going on, the, on their way to the, to the promised land. An 11-day trip. Now, God was going to take a little bit longer to train them, maybe upwards of a year. How long did that thing last? 40 years. And out of that initial generation who came out, 21 and over, how many actually got in? You want to know why? Because they never controlled this. You see, the problem with our mouths is they, they're tied to what's here. So what's here inevitably finds its way out and through here. And if you find in your life that what comes out of here oftentimes is complaint and grumbling and faithlessness and doubt, you want to know the reality? That is reflective of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to monitor this thing because that is a great diagnostic tool to see what's going on under the hood. In about two weeks, we're going to spend a whole sermon on that because the mouth tends to speak out of the overflow of the heart. So I'm not going to give myself to complaint and murmur and griping. I don't want the Lord, when I begin to talk, I don't want him to say, is that kid ever going to shut up? <laughs> Many of you have children. Have you ever reached that point where they're in the back seat just complaining about something? You just say to yourself lovingly, is that kid ever going to shut up? <laughs> now God is gracious and thankfully he is. Because I would have taken a hammer to all of us a long time ago. He's good. But let's not trifle with that. Let's watch what comes out. I've covered one verse this morning. I have four more minutes. Help the pastor out. Verse two. In the beginning of part three. Then we're going to close. We'll save the rest for next week. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And he does what? He refreshes some translations might say he restores my soul. So we see here in that God provides both what I'm going to call sustenance and rest. You see, Psalm 1 introduces the idea, Psalm, Psalm 23 verse 1 introduces the idea that God meets our every need. The rest of the psalm begins to touch upon the needs that he meets. And we see in verses 2 through the beginning of verse 3, he meets our need for sustenance and rest. Let's talk about sustenance first, a little bit of culture and history for you. The land of Israel did not have plentiful, verdant pasture land except in the rainy season. Shepherds needed to guide their sheep to green pasture. Otherwise, the sheep would go hungry. Furthermore, sheep will not drink from a rushing stream. 
nor will they instinctively seek out clean water. Sheep are prone to drink just whatever is nearby. You find a gross pond that's not a bunch of moving water, and it's covered and full of toxin and poison. Sheep are all over that. Therefore, a good shepherd leads his sheep both to green pasture for feeding and to calm and clean water. What do I resolve upon the hearing of this passage? I will avail myself of the nourishment, the sustenance that is available to me through the Lord. Do you realize biblically that Christ is likened both to bread and water? Do you hear that? Jesus Christ likens himself, and I have the references in my notes, to both bread and water. So if you have a need for sustenance, for spiritual nourishment, I point you no further than Jesus Christ, who as the good shepherd has made himself available to you to sustain you. You want to know what else is likened to bread and water in the Bible? The Bible itself. Scripture likens itself, the author of Scripture likens the word, the inspired word of God, to bread that will sustain us, food that will sustain and nourish us, but also water that can sustain and cleanse. So the imagery of verses 2 and 3, the beginning of part 3, has this idea that God leads us to places of sustenance and nourishment. Many in the sound of my voice don't, may not realize it, but you're starving for what he has to offer. And you will not find fulfillment that truly satiates until you come to him. Which again goes back to verse 1, the first part. You will not have the benefits of Christ apart from knowing him as Lord. Because you can't have his benefits while not serving him. So get to know him, get to serve him, and feast on him. And I'll say number two as I begin to close. That this idea of green pastures and still waters and beyond, it also has the idea or evokes the idea of rest. What do I resolve upon hearing, the hearing of this passage? I will revel in divinely ordained moments of rest because they're refreshing to the soul. Life is a seasonal thing. It's one season after another. I'm not talking about just spring, fall, and beyond. I'm talking about in life. We go through varying phases or periods. There are moments of extreme difficulty and affliction and sorrow. Who's ever faced any of those? As they say, if, if you're a believer, really if you're a human in general, you're either going into such a time, in the midst of such a time, or coming out of one. So there are these moments of difficulty, but you know what else? There's also moments in the Lord where he gives us rest. Moments of bliss, moments of delight. They feel a little you know, few and far in between, however you want to phrase it. I wish there were some more of them, it seems, along the journey, because if you look back over the course of your life, it seems like you tend to face more difficulty at times. Especially when you're in the midst of it, it's very easy to forget the good things, the moments of rest that he has given. But when I'm in the midst of one of those times, I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to revel in it. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to allow him to do his restorative, recuperating work that when I have to move on from that season, come down to, from the proverbial mountaintop into that valley, I'm going to be much more able to properly handle that thing. Because valleys come no matter what you do. The question is how ready do you want to be for them when they do arrive another one i will not grow lax in seasons of ease because this has been the undoing of many men and women of faith help the pastor out when did king david fall into sin with bathsheba it wasn't in a moment of extreme crisis and difficulty it was in a season of extended blessing victory and ease he began to rest on his laurels a little bit too much he stopped pressing into god and it didn't take long for him to deteriorate into a complete monster. And I do close with this. I will look first and foremost to the Lord for restoration when required. I've read that sheep will sometimes fall too far to one side, causing them to roll over onto their backs. Now that might sound, not sound like a big deal to you, but that is a potentially deadly condition for them for two reasons. Number one, on their backs, they can't fix themselves. They can't right their condition, which exposes them both to predators, because again, if there's sheep, there's probably some wolves nearby, and there's always a predator just looking for the one that's on its back that can't fix its way. 
And also in that position, gases will begin to build in the abdomen that can ultimately cause death, according to my reading and research. Do you realize that the shepherd has the duty of what they call restoring the sheep? He restores my soul. It's this idea of the shepherd coming along and seeing a sheep in that place and saying, you know, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to get you right side back up so that you can begin to thrive and flourish again. Many of us spend a lot of time on our backs and all of our limbs spiritually flailing and we feel lost and we grasp after things that are not genuinely going to help. How many turn to drugs? How many turn to alcohol? How many turn to gambling? How many turn to illicit relationships? We look for everything and everything to fill us when what we need is to look to the shepherd and say, I'm in a rough way and I don't know how to fix this thing and I cannot fix myself, but you can. You want to know what God will do? He'll come along and he'll set you straight. And then once you're on your feet, he's going to say, you know what, follow me. Because you fall over for a reason in the first place. You strayed and did your own thing. And if you find yourself in the proverbial gutter on the side of the road, let him come and fix you. And then learn how to follow him appropriately next time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and he finally he restores or he refreshes my soul. I've given you about eight or nine significant resolutions, about 14 or 15 more to come next week and potentially even into the next at the pace in which I am going. But these things do us no good if not applied. So the question to you is when you leave this place, when the pastor says amen, and you inevitably make the 40-yard dash out of this place, by the way, hang out, have some coffee for a while. There's refreshments. Don't rush off. Go get your kids, of course, and then fellowship for a while. But what you do with this is really what matters. Because what Christianity is founded upon is not just what you know. It's what you believe and diligently seek to apply Father, we come before you this morning, almost this afternoon, with a spirit of humility and thanksgiving, recognizing that we are not qualified to shepherd ourselves. We desperately need you. We confess our need for you. We believe in our need for you and believe in you to meet our every need. God, for those who have heard this word this morning, both in person and online, that you would move mightily in and through and that they would embrace one or two of these many principles and see positive change and transformation. We thank you for this time. As we go our separate ways, add your favor and your blessing. Keep us mightily, God. Let your peace be with us all. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen.